Welcome to Breaking Banks. As we like to do from time to time, this week we're sharing some new content from around the Provoke.fm network. Matteo Rizzi is executive producer and co-host for Breaking Banks Europe, and he sat down with Neville Burke from Futurist and Drew Graham, former director of digital strategy for Barclays. They bring a truly international perspective to exploring the tensions between talent and infrastructure, and between corporate executives and entrepreneurs. I especially like the way that Neville describes the corporate inclination to try to explain a future that is unexplainable, and how HR too often serves as a risk management function dedicated to maintaining the status quo. Then Matteo and Drew dive in even deeper to look at some of the ways mature organizations get in their own way through policies and practices that filter out the very rebels needed to drive real change from within. Then they look into some groundbreaking models from some of the most innovative financial institutions in the world. All of this comes at a time when I'm wrapping up a busy summer teaching at some of the leading graduate schools of banking and gearing up for the heart of the strategic planning and budgeting season. I've had the opportunity to spend quality time with hundreds of current and future leaders over the past couple of months. I'm more optimistic than ever about their motivation and ability to create an exciting new future for their organizations. But at the same time, I'm continually reminded of the biggest risk, which is not changing, and how wrong so many boards and leadership teams get that calculus. As Bill Gates likes to say, success is a poor teacher. You can listen to Breaking Banks Europe on any of your favorite podcast platforms or subscribe at provoke.fm. Hey guys, Uh, welcome back to Breaking Banks Europe. I am Matteo Rizzi, uh, executive producer of the show. And uh, today we are putting together two apparently uh, not homogeneous uh, uh, words, talent and infrastructure. And we have two estimated guests in two separate conversations, starting with uh, our uh, long lasting uh, guest, because uh, uh, I know Neville since uh, almost Dino Tribe time, so it's been a few years already. He worked a lot with uh, Maria Latanasova, uh, who is like a former Swift colleague. So, Neville, you have been with us before. Uh, welcome back uh, to. Breaking Banks. Neville, please introduce yourself again to our crowd. Thank you very much, Matteo. Uh, delighted to be back. Um, uh, I began my career, Matteo, as a youth worker, social worker, and I gradually made my way into HR. And um, I spent actually 30 years, uh, I'm not that young, uh, 30 years in corporate life, um, being a rebel, being countercultural. And um, but working with talent, working with change, working with talent infrastructure. And for the last four years, um, I've been on the outside as a I describe myself uh, with my partner and colleague, Ronan Myler, we're practitioner led consultants. So we're we now consult into organizations, but we do so from having walked in the footsteps Uh, of internal practitioners. And uh, that's a little bit about me. I'm based in the West of Ireland, and um, but my work uh, typically goes across Ireland, the UK and Europe. Amazing, Neville. I, I, you have a very particular like uh, history and, uh, and experience. And I, I don't know, I, I would start by, by saying this. I don't know if you, if you agree. So if you, if you check on LinkedIn, uh, Only since maybe what two or three years, maybe a little bit more, uh, you can find the uh, actual sort of work titles such as, uh, uh, you know, uh, skill manager or like a talent manager or uh, head of uh, head of talent uh, and uh, you know head of retaining talent uh, or maybe the, the last one is. Uh, Is, uh, is even grammatically incorrect, but you see what I mean, right? So I believe that uh, uh, my sense uh, is that uh, the corporate world has uh, understood uh, a little bit like uh, later the importance of uh, retaining uh, and uh, training their talents. Uh, 
And of course, I have a rather limited uh, sort of vision of it because, uh, uh, you know, as you know, I'm very vertical on financial services. But I almost would like to say that uh, 10 years ago, when startups started hitting hard, it still took another four to five years for banks and insurance companies to understand that uh, other type of talents uh, might be useful for for actually for them to thrive and in some cases for them to to survive. So what's your analysis on this? So I'm, um, I take the optimistic pessimist view uh, of, of this, Matteo. Um, and, I, and I go back to kind of organizational psychology. I, I think it's a bit like, you know, organizations are, are like, I think the metaphor that Marianne Chidiak used was the ocean. And the waves at the top, they are the initiatives, they are the current trends, they are the, uh, they are the new job titles uh, in many respects. But then you've got this, the depth of the sea where it's not necessarily clear that the energy and the change that's happening on the surface is permeating down through the organization. And that is making itself felt in the daily reality um, of a 24-year-old dissentient thinker who's a bit of a rebel mindset. I'm not quite sure that they feel uh, necessarily the... Uh, the initiative change, the branding change that's happening uh, at the level of the wave. And of course, then the seabed, uh, Chidiak would say to us, is like the organizational uh, personality, which is slow changing and slow moving. And, and I think it's interesting that you put the two words together, talent and infrastructure, because talent is very much future, hopeful, forward focused, uh, and it's got this creative kind of sense to it. But infrastructure has got this dichotomy of control, uh, rigid tram lines, um, it's concrete, it's less malleable and it's less flexible. And the two coming together is I think where that dichotomy of rebels, talent, creativity and innovation with the organizational needs and the control needs of scale and large corporates creates a tension. And I think it's that tension we're probably uh, really talking about um, in this conversation. Absolutely. You know, in, in, in sometimes you say, you know, you're, you're pushing an open door. And, and, and in this case, I don't think there is even a door, you know, when you, when you talk with me about, uh, you know, rebels, unconventional talents and, you know, you know well that this is like right into uh, the depths of uh, of my thinking and also a little bit my uh, my experience so uh, your clients uh, since uh, you sort of uh, stepped out as you said and 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 have an outside view of this uh, of this type of work uh, which type of request uh, your your clients come to you with you know because mm. you know they of course, there are the standard stuff like, uh, you know, I want to put together a program uh, to like uh, of uh, uh, talent, uh, uh, you know, to retain my talents, for example, or, or, or simply to retain my personnel, you know, the, or, or, or to upskill my executives or, and that's sort of, uh, uh, I want to say the tip of the iceberg, right? But uh, how do you think they realize that? And uh, do, I, do they have their ideas clear in mind when they come to you and ask for advice? I'm really curious about it. So I would say, of course, one, one wasn't, doesn't want to do anything other than pay compliments to one's clients <laughs> <laughs> in the public domain. But I, I would say, actually, the, the presenting issue uh, varies in uh, in nature, actually, um, because we are a, a group of um, HR professionals who have stepped out of HR, 
we have run talent programs in our organizations, but we've also run transformational change, organizational change, organizational redesign, um, engagement programs, um, industrial relations, employee relations. So our work has spanned uh, that. And what we see actually as the common thread, the common theme of the nature of our work is we're invariably working in regulated environments, uh, financial services, pharmaceuticals, med tech, med devices, uh, food, food science. All of them have very, very similar characteristics in the context of being highly regulated. And, um, and within that, leaders are intuiting that their own methodologies of control and coordination are uh, becoming less effective as the organization moves and organizations move from these closed boundaryful entities where leaders could control to very large degrees the daily life and the activities and even the thought processes of the members of the organization to more open organizations where change is not just top down, but it is outside in, it is bottom up, it's 360 degrees, it's viral in nature. And a lot of the work we do, whether it's in org redesign, whether it's in developing talent development initiatives or leadership development initiatives, in many respects is about preparing leaders for the new mindset of leading with less control, with less power, and with less structure. And it is creating the context in which the talent can start to self-construct its own learning for the future. One of the great realizations that I came across in financial services, and I worked for a, a, an Irish bank, Bank of Ireland, uh, going through a major digitalization and change to its middle office and front end uh, for a number of years. And I was responsible for the culture and capability elements of that transformation. Was um, organizations treat building capability for the future like a control and a compliance process? As if it can accurately what predict. What a paradox, right? <laughs> exactly. As if it can accurately predict what that future will be. And in many respects, leaders feel a tension to explain the future to people. Um, a future that's unexplainable. Um, and in many respects, this is where we see the tensions in, in modern leaders and their inability. They've never been trained uh, and, and uh, socialized to display the vulnerability of not knowing. They've had this, um, this, uh, this leadership confidence of the certitude of being right and, and, and all knowing. But of course, now that we're coming to this really uh, unpredictable future, uh, leadership requires a vulnerability. And in many respects, it moves from preparing leaders to provide answers to preparing leaders to ask questions. And that the talent infrastructure of the future is about creating a context in which leaders and talent professionals can ask emerging talent questions. The answers to which the talent will self-construct and create the pathways of the future for these organizations rather than being these uh, dependent conformists looking to the hierarchy for the answers about the future. The future is a co-created future. So in many respects, this is what we do. We create action through learning. So it's not quite action learning, but it's action through learning programs embedded in the context of organizations in which the emerging talent explains to the leadership what the future can be. And in that um, topical based learning environment, they work on the types of capabilities required for the future, like sense making, sense giving, critical thinking, problem solving. Um, in many respects, we, we, our, our basic design goes back to the Finnish model of education 
uh, from the early uh, the early tens, where they started working on topical based education with four C's: communication, critical thinking, um, collaboration, and uh, creativity. And we would add a fifth C to that, which is context. And uh, all great development of talent and all talent infrastructure must be grounded in an appropriate context. And that's the context of the organization. That's, a, um, that's super helpful also because it, it, it sets the, 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 uh, well, uh, the context for, uh, uh, you know, now now we talked about uh, you know perception, culture, you know the different pillars. Let's uh, let's try to get a couple of uh, to give a couple of examples, right? Because we don't have, uh, of course, a specialist uh, audience. We have a generalist audience, and you know what? I will I will start because it, it happens so that uh, one of the projects we are dealing uh, with my uh, small consulting companies. Uh, of which Mariela is, uh, is is part of. We're working with uh, with the um, with the bank, with an Italian bank, and uh, the the objective of mission is the fact that uh, the in the whole bank there is this uh, need of uh, working more with startups and entrepreneurs. Uh, but at the same time, there is also the acknowledgement of the fact that uh, uh, there is very little. Uh, perception and knowledge about uh, who is an entrepreneur, how does he or she thinks, you know, how do uh, relate with the startup and with the small with the small companies, things that the bank has rarely do uh, has rarely done done before. So we put together an on the ground uh, training programs where we almost simulate a uh, an entrepreneur, uh, pass or or travel, you know, for a number of executives of the of the bank, so that at the end of that at the end of that journey, they understand uh, what does it mean to build a startup, what does it mean to create a pitch, what does it mean to look for money, what does it mean to do a, like a small financial plan, what does it mean to integrate or not that startup within the organization, and that's very specific. A very specific learning of a new skill that I call entrepreneurship, right? You know, many large organizations did not take that as a necessary skill before, by definition, right? Because entrepreneurs and corporate life were almost, uh, you know, in 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 an opposite in opposite grounds. So. Why don't you, if you can, and you know, uh, being as generic as I as I was in terms of uh, which type of clients we're talking about. Uh, but why don't you give us a couple of examples of uh, talent infrastructure work that uh, you and your and your team have, have done with, with our clients, Neville? Absolutely. Um, actually, uh, the first one that comes to mind, Matteo, is very similar to what you've done. Um, of course, the, the irony we see is, is this idea of intrapreneurship and entrepreneurship are treated in organizations as if uh, staff are the problem. And uh, of course, the problem is the context of the uh, both culture and systems of a large corporate remove the ability to be entrepreneurial because of these layers of governance whereby uh, humans are uh, um, unable to make the types of decisions and take the types of risks that it requires to be entrepreneurial. However, when they leave work in the evening and they go home, they are invariably the CEO of the business that is their home. It has an income. They make decisions about how to leverage up to get their mortgage, to get their car loan. Um, they take other risk-based decisions like their pension and their life insurance, and they work on budgets and they have plans. So invariably, every human being in their daily life has the attributes and has the practice to be both innovative, creative, and entrepreneurial. 
But in that context of the environment in a corporate, they intuitively know because they're socialized from the beginning of their employment, they are disabled from behaving in this manner. So the question is, is how do you create the context in which they are enabled and in which they are empowered to behave in this manner? So pretty much like you, we ran, uh, essentially, we took the concept of a startup weekend and we started running, running it for bankers. And it turns out, you know, that bankers, those gray pinstripe wearing, boring people of our bias and our prejudice are just as creative and just as entrepreneurial um, as those people who worked in startups. They're just in a context in which they're not empowered and they're not enabled. And we've seen a number of pretty interesting startup ideas emerge from that. Um, a second uh, uh, example is this idea of preparing people for the future. So organizations very often believe that they've got to explain the future to people and that they've got to provide the vision with a level of certainty and provide a guaranteed certitude of what the future is like uh, for people. Because in some way, they have sensed that people are unable to deal with ambiguity. And of course, people do worry about ambiguity and they worry about uncertainty like job security, as we all would if we had um, income uncertainty on our time horizon. But we put together a program called Future Focus, where instead of telling people what the future was like, we brought a random group of people together. And I'll come back to why it's random in a minute, because that is important. A random group of people together um, across an organization um, within the HR function of all functions, because we believed that the first function we needed to train uh, and socialize in this idea that the learning should be uh, self-constructed, co-constructed, um, and, and in a sense freestyle was HR, because HR typically owns the talent infrastructure space. And having had a lifetime in HR, my realization is that HR is a risk management function, like all other risk management functions. It's about the maintenance of the culture. And typically that means in large part, the maintenance of the status quo, um, although very often our mandate is a mandate of change. Um, but we had a group of HR people, none of whom had any coding capability, any technical capability. Um, and in different groups, all to you know, varying degrees of success or whatever, they went in the, in the words of the sponsors, far beyond their articulation of a future than the leadership would have been prepared or brave enough to articulate to the staff themselves about what the future would be like. And one of the groups created a blockchain identity solution which has been given by the bank to the Irish banking sector and is now being developed into a, uh, an identity and professional skills and capabilities and accreditation tool such that the customer can validate from the get-go that the financial advisor they're speaking with in the industry is accredited and has the necessary skills and licenses so that therefore they're not dealing with somebody uh, who's a cowboy, for example. Um, and this came from a group of people who in their daily experience would never encounter this type of technology. But when you release them into a phase of exploration, curated and moderated exploration, they are as curious and they are as creative and they are as capable of taking uh, the information, the concepts, the ideas that they find and bringing it back into their context and then creating something meaningful for the organization. This was really interesting for the leadership uh, of a bank because it was a polar opposite. Uh, and polarity is something that we, we, we need to discuss as well because these ideas of structure and creativity, regulation and innovation, are polarities in a modern environment that talent infrastructure needs to transcend. 
it needs to provide both structure and the freedom to be creative, uh, which in many respects is a uh, an absence of boundaries. It's an absence of process. It's let the process emerge. It's an emergence, which is an uncomfortable space for corporates and HR and talent professionals in corporates uh, to be, because in many respects, it feels like you're giving up control. That last point I would make is this idea of uh, a random group of people. Um, one of the things and one of the, the reflections I would have about my, my lifetime in organizations and in corporates is we rush to selection too quickly. And selection is a narrowing part of the process. So if we think of the diamond, uh, the beginning of the diamond is an expansive exploration side of the process. And then you pivot and you start to start narrowing and you make decisions. Selection is a narrowing process. This comes back to the design principles of a lot of talent infrastructure, which is they're designed to be expensive. And therefore, because they're expensive, we can only afford to allow a select group of people access to the... In which, uh, in which sense do you say they are designed to be expensive, Neville? So, so ma many uh, particularly senior executive leadership development programs are designed to be very expensive, right? And there is this air that the more expensive they are, the better they are. Yeah, but in like many the respects, super expensive California trips to Google... Like or to uh, singularity, the or, the, or exactly, whatever. exactly. But actually, um, we believe that that selection process happens too quickly. That actually, the idea with talent begins with mass participation, and you've got to create the idea and the platform in which mass participation can take place, and people opt in which tells you a lot because those who don't opt in, you're gaining valuable information on these people as well. Absolutely. It's a bit like uh, Google and Amazon looking at our selections online is far more valuable information than the actual selection and the product we buy of itself. And looking at people's choices about what talent infrastructure they willingly access rather than they attend on a compliance basis is really amazing data for us to be able to analyze. And then naturally, people display capacity, they display capability, and they become naturally competitive, and the cream rises to the top. And it's at that point where they have self-selected on the basis of interest and capability that you have an alignment with then expensive investment in capability and in infrastructure. So one of the things we would be saying about if you want to hack a culture, and you want to change a culture through things like your talent infrastructure, you've got to design for mass, as mass participation as possible. Um, let people in, stop excluding them would be our motto. So, Neville, I, this is like the, the, one of these uh, shows where, you know, it is scheduled for half an hour and, and it should be for three or, or, or four, which is, which is great for our audience because the time literally has, you know, flew. Uh, what, a, a couple of tweets, uh, Neville, on this. Uh, how much is an art and how much is uh, something that you can learn? dealing with the talent infrastructure for a corporate for you i mean you are you you do what you do and you plan what you can plan today because of your 30 years of corporates and because of uh, your your extremely focused experience on 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 the field and yet you know, for even, you know, for, from the two examples that you made, it looks like uh, there is no recipe, right? Each client, each structure has a different story and a different approach. Is that true? Or how much of it is uh, standard and how yeah. much of it is, uh, is an art? So uh, what I'm saying to you is quite a lot of it is standard, but it is at the level of design principles, so we, we start with this concept that there are certain design principles that are uh, worth having, such as the, the power of mass participation, 
uh, design for cheap. Um, uh, ask questions, not don't provide content. Because um, on their iPhone today, uh, your participants have access to better content than you can ever provide them. So by practicing accessing content, they learn to filter what's good content and bad content, et cetera, uh, which, of course, is an extremely necessary uh, skill in, in the world of today. So I would say that the skill is in designing the design or identifying the design principles up front. And then what we do is we bring those design principles with us, but we design within each organization's particular context. Because as I've said to you, the fifth C is context. Um, you know, a lot of people walk the battlefield of Waterloo learning about strategy uh, in the context of that battlefield. But that was Napoleon's context. That was the Duke of Wellington's context. How do you take that back and, uh, you know, reflect it in your thoughts about customer centricity in your organization or on your product strategy or your proposition strategy? Um, so, you know, it's better for you to learn about strategy, grappling with the strategic issue that you've got to deal with. So I would say there is a level of skill. I think the skill is letting go the desire for control and boundaries up front, but creating design principles. Uh, the design principles are based on good psychology. They're based on adult development. They're based on the vertical development um, uh, of, of adult learning and good psychology. So, you know, mass participation, scarcity has a value, you know, design for cheap, but not for free. Um, make people commit. So, for example, we run a lot of our programs on Friday and Saturday. So the Friday is given free by the company. The Saturday is given free by the participant. So there is a mutual investment. Uh, so it's, it's free access, but you've got to give your time. Um, so a lot of these little psychological tricks go into the design principles, which, you know, uh, filter those who are interested from those who would just be compliant because they think this is what management want me to do. Um, and they, they do lots of little things like that. And I think, look, the, the general principle, I was very, as was my colleague, Roland uh, Myler, we were very taken by a guy called Michael Young. Michael Young was a sociologist in Britain in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. He invented the word meritocracy. Although when he invented the word meritocracy, he didn't uh, use it in a positive sense. Um, but he had this concept of a communitarian meritocracy. So you're, it's meritocratic, but within a community and a caring community. And he had a brilliant line, which was, it is the duty of the organization to make individual excellence as easy as possible. While the duty of the individual is to do as well as possible on as little as possible. And we try and bring a little of that to every engagement with both the individual and the corporate. And I think the line that we have is that it's about making the system relevant to the individual and about giving the individual relevance in the system. Emil, that's a brilliant, uh, that's a brilliant conclusion. Thank you very much for, uh, for being with us. In the, in the next half, uh, in, in the next part of the show, we're going to have an inside view with, uh, with my friend, uh, uh, Drew Graham. In the meantime, Neville, thank you very much for being with us. I have the sensation that this is not going to be the last time that you're going to be one of our guests. Thank you very much for being with us, Neville. Thank you very much, Matteo, and uh, the best of luck to you and all of Inner Tribe, and I look forward to speaking with you again. Great. It's a wrap, guys. Stay tuned. Hey, guys. Uh, welcome back uh, to the break. Today, we talk uh, talent infrastructure. Neville just gave us uh, a sort of, uh, uh, I want to say, outside view of this, uh, of this type of uh, challenge. And now, in this uh, second part of the show, I'm here with actually a, a good friend, uh, uh, a someone that uh, I proudly count into the contributors of my Talents and, and Rebels book. 
and uh, actually uh, sorry so his name is drew and i will let him sort of uh, give the usual couple of minutes uh, self-introduction but i have to say something first so drew two years ago uh came to me saying listen you know the, i am now in the in this new job and uh, but uh, i i give myself two years because i always promise that i can't you know I mean, it's very rare that they can sort of keep being motivated more than two years in the same working environment so i am very likely to leave in two years so we are now two years and uh, 11 days uh, uh, later and drew just announced that he is now unemployed so it's sort of uh, with 11 days uh, sort of uh, uh, gap he, he maintained his promise and uh, please join me in uh, welcome my friend drew graham to the show drew welcome to breaking banks europe thank you very much Mateo. <laughs> it's very good to be here so give us a couple of uh, you know a couple of history history words about uh, about yourself in whatever way in whatever you, you're allowed you're a free you're a free okay. man so you're allowed to say whatever you want however you want which is beautiful because so am i indeed now that i'm unemployed i can say uh, i can say whatever i want uh the uh i had to end up turning down my bio for my most recent employer um, got hauled up in front of corporate communications because in my in my bio, which is obviously not one that the bank wrote, uh, I described myself as selling my soul to the devil. And they said that they were working very hard to change their uh, to change their brand and change the impression that the world had of them of being devils. And having one of their public faces describe themselves as working for the devil didn't help. Uh, so we, we managed to come to an agreement where it now just says, uh, since uh, since selling his soul, I just removed to the devil from it. But there we go. Uh, <laughs> I just did a couple of years at a bank uh, doing digital strategy with some, some wonderful, uh, smart and lovely people. Um, and uh, before that, uh, did a few years in Hong Kong, uh, building uh, one of the virtual banks in Hong Kong from scratch that was funded by Standard Chartered. Uh, before that, did a small gig uh, running fintech strategy for Standard Chartered, uh, which I think is how Matteo and I met because I got to fly all over the world, hanging out with my friends. Um, and because I had a beard and wore t-shirts, I therefore worked in fintech. And uh, before then, it's just a whole load of fintech entrepreneurial nonsense. Uh, a, a, uh, a payments company uh, in Indonesia um, being the highlight of it, but my life before then is just entrepreneurial stuff in Papua New Guinea and Australia and the UK and Singapore and Hong Kong. So I'm a serial entrepreneur uh, who has rented his soul to the devil for a few years uh, to learn how banks work and operate and how such big buildings full of such mediocre people can make so much money. And now I'm building a new thing with some friends who are very smart and lovely um, and we're going to fix it so it's uh we're going to talk about the uh, about your own personal future uh very soon uh, i guess also because that's part of a more like a personal catch up i'm i'm very much looking uh, uh, forward to uh, and uh, I was thinking, while you were like giving your the, the, your, your version of uh, uh, of of the past, uh, you know, uh, small twenty years, uh, that the huge difference between uh, the first part of this uh, show and this one is that one, this is really an inside view about uh, you know how talent uh, can and uh, or, or is not you know, uh, managed sometimes. But most importantly, that this, this is like a pretty vertical in uh, in financial services, which with Neville was the case, but now Neville is actually working with uh, other regulated uh, entities. You know, he was mentioning, you know, food and, and, and medic and med tech uh, and uh, uh, like insurance. But, uh, you know, Drew and I really share this uh, uh, I want to say fintech nonsense. I, I I like it. I like it a lot. 
uh, especially because after 10 years, uh, one could almost say that the fintech is a, is a meta thing, that uh, most of the other thing in financial services are actually relied upon. But we're not here to talk about fintech, we're here to talk about talent. And, uh, you know, the reason why, uh, Drew, I, I wanted you to, uh, you know, like, uh, to get interviewed for uh, for for the book, talking about a different type of talents because you are part of them, for sure, and and as well as uh, you know the rebel sort of sniff each other, as we often as we often say, uh, the 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 um, the nature of your not being uh, a conformist. Uh, being a good dissenter, so it was sort of evident, you know, which I believe is what made our our friendship so strong in in such a short uh, period of time, at least in the in the in the aspiration in the way of seeing the seeing the world. So, uh, can you, you know, Drew, why don't we don't you share with the the, the with our audience, uh, you know, what is it for you, you know, or what it has been for you? as a different type kind of talent. Uh, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you're like a master of your soul, you don't really care. But you have been a few sort of, you know, you mentioned like a standard shelter. You, you have worked for a few large organization in a very sort of peculiar role. How did, how did, how did it feel, you know? What, uh, what could you have changed if you, if you had the possibility to, you know, just, you know, Tell us a little bit, how did it make you feel? Well, the, the middle question there of what would I change? Uh, that's going to be a topic. Um, so I, I don't know if the people who have employed me in hindsight would describe me as a talent, as you so kindly have, Matteo. I think there has always been somebody in uh, the, the bank, Stanchart, or whoever I worked for, uh, who uh, got value out of me and for who I um, uh, I gave them something that they couldn't get elsewhere. But I think that if you rounded up 100 people inside each organization uh, and asked them whether or not I was a talent, I think that you would find a very small percentage of people that would agree with you uh, because uh, I just would never play the game. Uh, there's a, a quote from our mutual fund later, uh, which is, uh, who describes, I think she used it to describe her previous life when she worked for, I assume, uh, QNB as the insurance policy, the corporate's better demons wished upon their future selves. And in typical later poetic style, it's rather beautiful, but that's kind of how I've ended up thinking about defining myself. Uh, that I'm, I, I'm the insurance policy that they get to have uh, if they so want. But at the same time, you don't get an insurance policy because you think it's going to pay out. You get an insurance policy because you think it isn't going to pay out. And uh, I believe, and I am right, and I will go to my deathbed believing this, that uh, financial services, banking in particular, is just fundamentally structurally foundationally broken uh and over the last few years i've refined the framework as to how it's broken and how one would fix it but all it was going to take for one of these large organizations to uh, decide to do something about this is uh, both a ceo and a board who have got the courage and the appetite to do it and then suddenly somebody like me in a large organization like that becomes absolutely invaluable. And that's kind of the execution of the insurance policy. And so I spent a couple of years sat there as uh, a call option, if you will. Um, uh, and uh, the first bank I worked for um, uh, called it, um, and we ended up doing some pretty incredible stuff in Hong Kong. Uh, and the second bank I worked for didn't really call it. Um, in the the two year, um, uh, the two year time that the call option was valid for, uh, and so uh, I'm going to go and do something else instead. Um, so that's how it, that's how I think about it. How did it make me feel? 
I, I, I do enjoy working for large banks uh, in a way that many of my other friends who work for large banks who are far smarter than me, far more experienced than me, um, and uh, far better corporate citizens and far better employees than me, um, they can't understand how much I enjoy working for banks because for them, the success of what they achieve in that job and that role is tied to their uh, satisfaction of working in, working in the bank. Like they have a project that they need to execute and the project has to get done. And then when the project gets done, they're happy. And then when the project doesn't get done, they're sad. And that's kind of a normal corporate paradigm of people in work. And certainly if I was the CEO of a company, that's kind of how I'd want people to behave. Like you want to be emotionally invested in the outcome of whatever element of work it is that you're doing. Whereas the thing that I've always said is that in order for me to succeed, the bank doesn't have to listen to me. I don't have to be proven to be right. I don't have to, the project that I'm working on doesn't have to succeed for me to be happy because I'm sat in a system which is structurally and foundationally broken to such a degree that the fact that nearly everybody in the system disagrees with me has got no um, it's not an indicator of the fact that the system is right and I am wrong. It's compl- it's broken to the degree where there is no concept of right or wrong within the system itself. Right or wrong is, uh, uh, I spoke about this in, in your book, it's a local truth, not a global truth. And so I, I enjoy working for banks because uh, I can say whatever I want based on the fact of uh, believing that I'm right with the knowledge that nobody's going to listen to me, because I get paid the same. I sleep exactly the same at night, knowing that I'm right, that the bank is structurally, foundationally not going to do what it needs to do uh, for reasons that have got nothing at all to do with the fact that I'm right and they're wrong, or they're right and I'm wrong. They're not. But they're doing it for reasons that are structurally and foundationally um, to do with the way that they're broken. And so I how do it make me feel? I really enjoy working for banks um, because there's the possibility they might exercise the call option and I might get to build something meaningful. Uh, and if they don't exercise the call option, I get paid a reasonable amount of money to sit around and be right for a living, which as anybody who's spent any time with me will know, I kind of enjoy. I get it. I get it, through. And uh, so what is true as well is that... Uh, it is kind of uh, some financial institutions is trying to to fix a problem that is very fundamental, which is their talent infrastructure problem. But let let let's talk, let's park it for a little bit and and, and let's uh, diving into into what you just said. So they try to fix it by hiring one or two so called. Uh, public rebels or or people with uh, a, such a different uh, and obviously different background that, uh, you know, that they have to be taken like innovative, right? Because they hire someone like you. So come on, look, you know, how, how can a bank not innovative uh, or not thinking innovatively hire someone like Drew, right? He would hire someone with, uh, you know, other characteristics, right? But they are not thinking uh, infrastructure. They are thinking they are thinking like a quick win, lipstick on a pig, uh, like uh, putting a nice pin on their jacket, whatever it is, right? Which makes me think that uh, the title that uh, I sort of, uh, to be honest, uh, improvised, uh, which is this infrastructure, the word infrastructure associated with uh, with talent. Uh, it is something that is absolutely not taken seriously, you know. Uh, I mean, th- there are, and, and you know, Neville before mentioned uh, a couple of very successful projects, uh, you know, super, like, uh, uh, nice intentions, uh, as well as uh, a genuine way to, like, uh, help your own employees uh, to get new skills, think more openly, think more disruptive, uh, you know, not getting immediately into the hiring part, uh, but getting into the problem statement part. All this is all this is nice, but it's rare, you know. And and uh, and I believe that the way 
some organizations is try to uh, is, is trying to solve is simply you know as as you said like uh, uh, keep sort of uh, um, uh, stay in the comfort of broken zone but at the same time having a few like a uh, supposed sparkle you know that uh, basically buy them time would you agree with that uh no mainly because there is no they when it comes to banks making decisions about hiring people like me the every time i've worked for a bank it has been because there has been a single individual who's known me previously uh who's thought hang on having a bull in a china shop who will say all of the heretical things that I know to be true, but my career is too important to me for me to say is useful to me. Uh, and I've been hired, uh, and the deal's been done before HR have even been involved, before talent have even been involved, before any That's interesting. element of they has ever been involved. And so, uh, and, and also I've, in my positions, always hired various people into banks. and. Everybody, is this true? Yes. Every single person I've ever hired into a bank, I have done despite HR and talent and around the they that you refer to as there being some, that the, the machine is somehow making a decision. So I don't have any evidence to suggest that the machine, that the bank as an, as an entity, as kind of an organic thing that does things, actually is capable of hiring an individual in the way that you describe it. I think that individuals who know how the machine works well enough to know how to uh, navigate it and avoid it have got the ability to hire individuals. But rather than the hiring of people like me in banks being, um, uh, being a strategy of just hire one individual because of this particular reason, I think it's actually the case of in banks there are uh, or always going to be a small amount of people like me and the, the individuals like me in the banks who decide that they need other people who uh, are like them will go out and find them and hire them uh, uh, despite uh, the machine, despite the bank. Um, uh, and uh, so I, I, I can, uh, one example is really uh, sticking in my mind. There's, there's a, I was hiring people in uh, in a bank. Uh, I'm going to leave it reasonably vague to protect the guilty. And uh, I uh, wrote a job description um, because that's what you do in a bank. And uh, uh, did it paying absolutely, hadn't even read whatever the guidelines or uh, requirements were for writing a job description. I just wrote what I wanted. Uh, and then... Uh, started trying to promote that through the various channels. Uh, and of course, immediately HR and talent are like, no, your job description has to include these 76 specific things and it has to be in this particular format and you have to say this. And I ended up finding somebody who worked in talent who had a brain, uh, which by the way is absolutely incredibly rare. And we had able to have a conversation about like, fine, you have to tick your boxes. I want to get work done. Where's the middle ground? We found some middle ground. Uh, and so that CV ended up, uh, that um, job description ended up going out there. And specifically, I wanted people who had actually built something before, as opposed to just done PowerPoint decks, uh, which the bank couldn't understand. Uh, and uh, second of all, I wanted somebody who, um, uh, somebody who hadn't worked in a big bank before. I wanted somebody who hadn't been poisoned by the organization. Uh, and so, like, Talent and HR then like did the thing they do, putting it in the places, got the CVs, sent me the CVs, and I was just getting crap after crap after crap after crap, and I couldn't figure out why. And a friend got in touch and uh, said that somebody that they'd recommended for the job had applied, and had I seen their CV, and I hadn't even seen their CV. So uh, I went back to Talent and HR and said, look, this person had applied, and I haven't seen their CV, and why is that? And we did a bit of digging. And talent and HR, regardless of what I'd asked for, somebody who'd never worked in the bank before, who'd actually built something, they had a uneditable 
um, you know, policy that was actually coded as a filter in some of the job portals that was taking somebody who, because a bit of the bank I worked in was technically strategy, if they hadn't worked, done at least two years in either a big bank or a consulting firm, they deleted the CV. And so, like, despite the fact that I knew what I wanted, uh, I ended up having to fight the system at every single stage. So the idea that the system is capable of selecting for people like me, I disagree with that. I ended up hiring this person uh, who uh, might be listening to this and he probably knows who he is and, and is, am I allowed to swear on this podcast or? No. Well, no? It, okay. Yeah. All right. no, that's fine. I can, I can hold well, it, it. It depends. If you don't, if you don't, if you don't warn me, maybe you can. No. Oh, okay. Fine. Well, I've warned you now. So I won't. He is brilliant. Uh, brilliant to the degree that after I'd hired him, uh, he ended up uh, being universally acknowledged across the team for every quarter as the best performing person in the team again and again and again. And still, after I'd left, again and again and again. Uh, uh, and is, is universally acknowledged as being brilliant. I'm going to pull him out and put him somewhere more worthwhile somewhat sometime soon. But I hired him going completely against every HR and talent policy and procedure there was. I found him. A, a mutual friend of yours and mine actually found him for me. Uh, I interviewed him. Uh, I then brought him back in to interview with other people. I then sent him all the way up the chain to somebody so senior that they weren't going to be able to say no. Um, uh, I then ran the process of actually doing the paperwork and bullying HR to be able to actually get the paperwork. Like HR and talent provided exactly zero to uh, make the process or uh, make it better. And at every single stage ended up trying to stop this from happening. So a very long story to say I disagree with your characterization of the situation because the bank, the organization as a whole, is incapable of either wanting people like me, selecting for people like me, or hiring people like me. It's an aberration that it happens. I get it. One of your, one of your uh, uh, sort of uh, part of your mission when, when you were working for a bank uh, one of the reasons why you're traveling so much is, is because, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were also, you know, in charge of uh, finding other models, you know, talk with your peers in other banks and stuff like that. Is, uh, is your current attitude and sort of findings uh, also the, 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 the consequence or, 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 or a consistent finding of all these exchanges that you had with other banks? Or have you, uh, you know, were you able to find uh, a model that you really liked or, or with good potential? I mean, you don't need to name the bank or whatever, but mm. uh, I'm curious, uh, uh, you know, this uh, fundamentally almost genetically broken, uh, uh, you know, system that you're referring to, it is. It has no sort of sparkle of hope, you know, during so many conversations that you had before. Yeah, um, there's four. Uh, there's four models uh, that spring to mind, and they're all kind of in. They're, they're different. The one that immediately springs to mind, uh, which is a bit, it's debatable whether or not you could actually call this an incumbent financial services organization, but uh, Ping An. Uh, and Ping An's talent model, uh, which, um, to oversimplify it, is a case of pick a couple of your best people, give them a bit of money in the same mission, and then it's a bit kind of Hunger Games fight to the death, and then whoever ends up hitting the best metrics after a given period of time gets all of the money and all of the people, and the other person gets fired. I I, I like that as a model of doing innovation, and I don't think anybody could deny that. What And this is, as, my, as I understand it, this is how... One Connect and Good Doctor uh, started. And so I don't think that you can really de uh, deny that that's going to be uh, effective. Uh, the second model I really liked is ING, which I don't think is a, uh, is a controversial one. But when you have a CEO who understands what digital means and understands what um, software means and understands what technology means and understands what the difference is between those three things, um, and is given enough rope to be able to go and run with that. Um, I, I've, I, I found some brilliant people in, uh, in ING um, who genuinely were building the right thing for the right reasons in the right way. 
Uh, and I think that just comes from the top, going back to my earlier point, when you have a board and a CEO with the right mandate and the appetite and the courage, then good stuff can happen. Uh, the third one that pops into my head is, and this is a bit of a controversial one, it's probably DBS in Singapore. Um, and I think DBS gets a lot of stick um, because uh, it has been said that DBS's best quality is innovation theatre. Um, and certainly uh, they're, they're, they've very successfully tied um, the outcomes of innovation to the share price in Singapore. But I think that what Neil did, what Neil Cross did in Singapore around, uh, and I, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, paraphrase Neil here, I'm not going to be able to get it exactly right, but the idea that you have to, you have to first of all build the dream and then you have to fulfill the dream. And I think that banks are incredibly good at building a dream and then ticking the box and saying, well, that's been done. Like we've, we've done the press release, we've done the marketing. So uh, now let's get back to business as usual. Whereas what Neil and DBS did is like build this, this dream and then actually follow through with it. Um, and it wasn't perfect, but in terms of getting good people in and getting them to do good stuff, um, I think Neil was successful there. Um, and the fourth example, which uh, I just want to give a name check to, is if you define innovation as being uh, increasing shareholder value, it's a bit of a nebulous term, but this allows me to use my fourth example. Then I think that what the reinventure guys did for Westpac in Australia, I think is the right model as well, which has got very little to do with talent directly as hiring people. But the best thing that a bank can do if they want to innovate and they want to get people to innovate is give startups money and get out of the way. And the reinventure Westpac model, which again, as I understand it, uh, Westpac was the sole LP in the reinventure corporate venture capital fund. Um, there wasn't any other money in the fund, but Westpac had effectively no say over the direction of the funds and hired a, a couple of brilliant people to actually run the fund. Uh, and Westpac uh, and reinventure made some incredible investments. There were a or pre A in Coinbase, as an example. Um, but that led to innovation for Westpac because Westpac's return on that fund was spectacular. Uh, so those are the four that, that spring to mind. Um, but arguably, out of all of those, uh, only half of them at best could really be argued to be banks that are doing it, which would be ING and DBS, and the rest of them are um, yeah, acknowledging hybrids. that. Yeah, hybrids. Yeah, but I think it, inherent in the other examples is the fact that banks can't do this. Like Ping An is not an incumbent financial services institution, and if I'm naming Ping An, then maybe I should be naming Ant and Tencent and everyone else. And the Westpac model is kind of acknowledging, well, we can't fix it internally, so let's just uh, take shareholder uh, take shareholder capital and give it to somebody who can which is kind of inherently acknowledging that you can't fix this problem internally. So some nebulous answers, but, but those are the ones that spring to mind. No, totally. I, I, I get it. And, and I know like uh, all the models that you, uh, that you mentioned, I, and, and I agree the the, the not invented here syndrome here is probably the, the, in terms of talent and, 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 and innovation capability is you know, most of the time, the one of the the biggest obstacles, right? Because it, it is extremely rare to find uh, an institution that uh, self-inspiring, uh, you know, is uh, is trying to even tackle, you know, this uh, this problem at the at the source. And the source mean uh, like a culture, you know, accepting, uh, you know, the divergent people and 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 so forth. I wouldn't, you know, we. At the end of the day, the show is called Breaking the Banks. So it's uh, I'm okay. I'm okay by saying uh, that uh, you know the model is uh, fundamentally fundamentally broken. But uh, thanks thanks God there are people like uh, like you who are keep fighting the system. And now I know we don't have uh, time anymore, and it's time to wrap up. But uh, 
uh, I am pretty sure that you're going to come back with your new hat very soon, uh, telling us uh, your next uh, your next story, Drew. Thank you for yeah, being with us. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Matteo. I appreciate your time. Cheers, guys. This is a wrap up. Stay tuned for the next episode of Breaking Back Europe. That's it for this week. If you like the show, make sure to give us a five star rating on your favorite podcast platform or share it with a friend or share it on social media. We'll see you again next week with more Breaking Banks. <laughs>